I mean, I was never that uh, talented at, at rock climbing. I was sort of good average, uh, but I really did enjoy it. I really enjoyed just doing half a dozen routes on a Saturday, Sunday, um, out in the Peak District, especially on grit. You're sitting there Sunday night on the X2 bus with the, the sort of grit embedded in your hands and the lichen and smelling it and and the steamy heat on the back of the bus, then eventually get into the whole scene of pubs and club dinners. and It, it uh, was a way of life that I just uh, naturally got into. Everything was done on a uh, shoestring budget. It was mostly hitchhiking. I, mean, I didn't get a car till I was about 26. Uh, I mean, hitchhiking in Dolomites to do the North Faces there and to Norway to do Troll Wall. And just natural curiosity took us to places like the Atlas Mountains, uh, Tibestian, Chad, Turkey and Iraq and Hindu Kush and all that. I don't know why I got into big wall rock climbing, mostly. I had this uh, crazy thing about seeking out the biggest overhangs. Uh, I could never rationalise the exposure. I always you know, couldn't sleep the night before and didn't feel that happy when I was on it either. But uh, for some reason I kept on pushing, going up things like the scoop in Stranola Dale, the big overhang on uh, Chimro Vest and the Dollies. But it all helped to um, enabled me to have the technical competence to handle myself on big walls. But then we did push off to the Alps in 61. I think we did nine routes in 12 days. And the last one was at Mont Blanc. And just as we arrived on the summit, all kinds of um, rockets were going off and, and flashes and, and pink uh, uh, smoke was, was let off from these canisters as, as a helicopter arrived. And the next thing, uh, there's there's Don Willens waddling up in the snow, uh, followed by Chris, and they just climbed the made the first ascent of Friendly Pillar. All the um, fireworks had, be, had been let off because the uh, helicopter people thought it was the French who made the first ascent. Uh, Dismay's on them, go. But of course, Chris and uh, Don and uh, Ian Clough and the Polish guy had uh, beat them to it. In uh, 1970, ending up in um, Yosemite, 38 pictures up the great granite cloud of El Cap was just something I had to do. Peter Harbour and myself made the first non-American, first European ascent of, um, of Salafé War. I think that we were both intimidated by this huge route, but by taking it one day at a time, we eventually sort of nibbled away at it. And it took about, I think we have four bivouacs. Now, of course, it's climbed in a day regularly. That gave me kind of confidence to, to go off to Baffin and try routes like um, Asgard, right on the Arctic Circle. And then high up um, on Shivling and perhaps particularly on the Ogre. I was drawn to Baffin Island. It's just an amazing place. I went there f four times in the 70s altogether. And that actually was sandwiched between two trips to Everest, Southwest Face. My first one was in 72 spring with the Germans, Don Williams and the Hayes from and myself were invited. And then afterwards came back again in the autumn on Chris Bonington's first trip to the South West Face. But uh, when I look back on them, actually, it's that Asgard climb that really stands out. I don't know if it's because subsequently went for a third time to the South West Face in 75, when actually um, we did it. And that really does stand out. I was just there up, up high with Dougal Haston and we topped out and uh, had the most amazing uh, few days then just uh, beyond the end of the fixed ropes and all the clouds were forming and billowing out of the valleys down there in Nepal. You just felt you were part of something much bigger than yourself and it was just amazing. The big problem with um, our trips to Everest, um, well it became a problem because it was decided to take oxygen which was reasonable enough at the time. We, to, um, stop the camps, uh, you're going to have to have a fixed rope. Fixed ropes put up from the glacier, and in our case, all the way up to Camp 6 and a bit beyond. Uh, and so it's in the last 2,000 feet where the climbing starts to feel like it does everywhere else, when you feel you're out there on a limb going for it, just you and your partner swinging leads. Up to that point, there's no real commitment. You haven't really left the ground because the rope's still, you're still connected to the ground. You sort of brought the ground up with you. That's the problem with those big sea style expeditions. But having said that, uh, on that, those, that particular one that Chris organised, and all of them really, all of us made friends that have lasted to this day. And it wasn't just because it was Everest, it was because we were up there with Dougal, who was at the top of the game and was a, just the perfect 
partner. We never mixed much so socially, but we did come together because we both wanted to do the same thing. I, I just know I had uh, tremendous respect for him. It was a bit of a doer character. He was very much like a Sherpa, um, completely self-contained, very economical. We never never wasted a step or a breath or, or, or a word for that matter. Just totally reliable and competent. And always led his pitch and wasn't the prima donna people used to write about. He took his share with the chores in the camp, you know, putting the brews on and all the rest of it. We don't think we had a hard word at all. There was never a hard word on, on any of our trips together. It was just, um, uh, we were just, just there looking out for each other the whole way. So, perfect partnership. But it was so sad that um, other plans we'd laid, like him going to Nupsi with us and uh, the ogre, uh, and uh, never took place because he was, of course, avalanched on in. in uh, 17th of January, 1977, gone. Buried under two foot of snow below the Riondas uh, uh, peak in Lausanne. The main thing from Everest 75, the southwest face, was uh, the bivvy. Being late on the top, we, we didn't um, get down very far. In fact, we only got, went down um, 100 meters vertically from the summit and um, had to bivouac without sleeping bags, no oxygen left. And um, so we dug a snow cave and spent the night in that uh, about nine hours and survived it. Well, that really did widen the range of what and how I might climb in the future. After surviving from not having oxygen, I personally wouldn't, would not need it again. But the first person to actually go up there and not use it was Reinhold and, and Peter. And that was a heck of a breakthrough and it meant a lot towards um, the furtherance of um, alpine style climbing high up. Reinhold, phenomenally st strong and highly, so highly motivated and experienced, was able to do that supreme thing of climb Everest, uh, completely solo from the north, partly by a new route, with only his pregnant girlfriend in support. I mean, there wasn't even a liaison officer down on the East Rongbuk Glacier. Most of us that um, were going out regularly doing new things were just taking a, a, a little step up you know, on the backs of those that went before. But Reinhold really did take quite a big step, <laughs> quite a leap. I keep reading and hearing that um, climbing has always been super competitive. I, I disagree with that. Um, I would say, as Don Willen said, that there's always been competition, but for the route, not to be better than anyone else particularly. We wanted to get the route done. We would be a bit annoyed if someone else was going to do the route before us, because that's where all the interest is, in going where no one's gone before, you know, looking around the next corner. Like Cicero said in the first century, what's always fascinated man most is the unknown. I tried for four years since Everest to, to go to Canton Junga. It seems we were the first to arrive at this um, north base camp site, uh, Pang Pema, since 1931, since Frank Smythe was, was there with the Swiss. And from then on, it was all kind of exploration. Everything had changed. The glacier had shrunk and uh, there was avalanches pouring off it. The weather was atrocious. The, the westers were really hammering the mountain. Uh, it was pretty grim actually. We sat in this uh, snow cave at 25,500 feet. We were saying, well, what, what are we doing up here exactly? I mean, uh, if we were the last men on the planet, would we be up here doing this? Definitely not. All oh, right, it's all ego, is it? Is it, is it? Are we up here suffering like this because we can't get control of our egos and just want to go home and impress everybody? What if we actually didn't just push that a little bit harder and, and take it to our limit? Wouldn't we be forever sort of dissatisfied? Three in the morning, I woke up completely rested, wide awake, with this certain feeling, like a voice in my chest telling me we shouldn't be going down any further. Now's the time to go straight back up. And I eventually, I pushed the blocks away from the entrance to the cave, and it was, for the first time, a completely windless, starry, early starry morning. The three of us set off and um, had another night out, up there, uh, without any oxygen on our back, just a butty bag, spare gloves, um, a torch and so on, but uh, 
just marvellous to be up there without all that weight. Uh, 28,000 feet, we are going so slowly, just uh, 10 paces, stop, breathe heavily for a few minutes and on again. We, uh, we pulled it off uh, against, against all the odds, really. But um, looking back, that was the most demanding climb I ever did. First time a big mountain had been climbed lightweight, without masses of fixed rope, without a lot of Sherpa support. You only tend to talk about your, uh, su your successes, but uh, looking back on my climbing, I've had um, four goes at K2, four goes at Nanga Parva, four goes at Makalu. Never got up. And actually, on, on these um, so-called failures, it's on those that, that um, in, in many cases, more interesting things happen. By definition, you can be on the top without having gone to your limit, but on a failure, you've quite often gone to your limit without uh, actually going to the top and learned more about yourself. When you are pushing the limits of your endurance, when you are climbing high, it does concentrate your mind. All your life becomes so kind of down to that point, so, so focused that all the rest of your life is very, very distant. And it does have the effect of, of calming that inner chatter. Why do you bother climbing? Why do you climb? Uh, all I could think of saying was, well, I get grumpy when I don't.